now at University of Gottingen, and Pinaki Chaudhary, who is sitting here in the audience. Uh, so, today's talk is going to be about universal stress correlations in crystalline and amorphous packing. It's a, a curious result we found uh, while analyzing uh, local stress correlations uh, in many different sorts of uh, long range, short range models. We found some surprising universality, which is what I will discuss uh, today. Um, So uh, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, we present a universal characterization of stress correlations in athermal systems. I'll describe what I mean by athermal systems. Uh, these stress correlations that I'm going to talk about are actually uh, found in energy minimized configurations uh, in particles with soft interactions. So if you were to look at glassy configurations drawn from some parent temperature, you would be looking at the inherent structures, that, are, that is what I am going to be talking about and that is where the stress correlations are being measured. Uh, and then we present these correlations across a wide variety of uh, initial conditions, both in crystalline as well as fully amorphous packings and uh, in some cases we can derive exact analytic results and so uh, we, I try to characterize this universality in uh, different ways across different models and what we find, this is sort of uh, jumping to the conclusion, large length scale behavior of these correlations seem to be independent of most things including uh, orientational order, structural correlations or even the range of interaction, even the type of interaction, this seems to be surprisingly universal. So I will try to motivate uh, why that happens uh, in the rest of my talk. So. Um, before I go into that, I would uh, sort of give a brief introduction of what kind of materials I am talking about. So, these, what I am really doing is measuring such correlations in simplified models, but the kind of materials we are trying to model are these disordered amorphous materials which are sort of ubiquitous. Um, so, I am uh, here I am just showing some sort of uh, uh, different kinds of materials that can be described with these simple computer models that I am re representing here. So, uh, cellular epithelial tissues, uh, foams which are uh, sort of robust to thermal fluctuations, rigid particle packings that also display elasticity at the large length scales even though the individual uh, particles have some sort of elasticity, the macroscopic elasticity emerging from these disordered networks is quite different. Uh, so, try to, to try to understand uh, such systems, we look at simplified computer models made out of uh, spheres um, that in, interact with some short range or long range interactions uh, which is what I will describe in detail and these seem to reproduce many characteristics that we are interested in including amorphous elastic behavior uh, which uh, I will sort of describe. Sorry. So just to go through the original uh, a formulation of elasticity in a continuum, uh, what you would do is you would write down the static equilibrium conditions, basically the divergence of the stress tensor is equal to the external force applied at every point in the continuum uh, elastic model uh, and then you can sort of write down a strain tensor which is uh, governed or given by this uh, derivative of a displacement field at every point. So you take an uh, elastic object, you deform it because of some external stress and you have a displacement field from which you can symmetrize and cr create a strain field and a strain tensor then can be written in terms of uh, a stress tensor using linear elasticity constants. So this lambda ijkl which is a four index object is basically an elasticity uh, constant made, uh, tensor and because of this linear elasticity, now I have this equa equation of static equilibrium, I get the closure relation. Uh, for the strain field. So, if I put this equation back in here, uh, I will simply get some second order equation uh, describing the displacement field of elasticity known as the cauchy navier equation and this is quite general. It tells you that in response to an external force applied on an elastic object, what is the deformation field that will occur through this very simple uh, mapping. Uh, you will be able to, if you solve this equation, get the displacement field and if you have the displacement field through this equation you will be able to get the stress tensor and so this basically gives you the stress response of an elastic object and these constants that you see mu and lambda and so, uh, uh, which are there in this equation re basically represent the bulk moduli and the shear moduli of the system. So those are uh, elastic constants, so this is uh, linear elasticity theory. So the question then naturally arises what happens if you have a disordered network? So if I look at one of the configurations that I was uh, showing you right at the beginning of the talk where, where you have 
particles which are arranged in a random spatial geometry, then is the same question valid or is, is the same theory valid at the length scales that I am considering here. For example, at the particle scale, clearly this does not have a well defined original state which is some crystal or uh, some sort of nice uh, ordered arrangement. So what you would have to do is create these packings and then actually solve the equations of force balance on the disordered network. Each network is individually different and so then uh, the static equilibrium conditions no longer become these homogeneous uh, equilibrium conditions on a continuum. You would have to actually solve this at the granular scale. So here I'm showing what you'd have to do. So you'd have all these contact forces between particles. So if you take this particle, there's some uh, contact force between this particle, this particle, and this particle. For every particle, you'll have to basically sum up the, the contact forces and that will sum up to the external force. And similarly, you'll have a torque balance condition. and what you could do is define a particle level force moment tensor which is, which plays the role of a stress tensor and this this is not readily amenable to continuum treat, uh, treatments but you could then write down some coarse strained uh, elasticity theory and try to see how well uh, this can be solved okay so this is the challenge of disordered networks that we want to solve so just to uh, jump ahead and tell you why it's a difficult problem uh, if you were to look at what happens to the stress transmission in such uh, granular systems, you see extremely inhomogeneous uh, propagation uh, of stresses. So uh, here's an experiment uh, uh, th that is done on photoelastic disks. So you have a two dimensional uh, structure of photoelastic disks, uh, which are sensitive to uh, stress. So if, the, if a disk is more stressed, then it scatters more light and you create these granular piles. So you create a granular pile over here um, and they're just two different kinds of disks. One of them is hexagonal disks, one of them is pentagonal disks. Uh, and you basically see that depending on what the in inherent geometry is or the underlying geometry is, the propagation of stress because the weight has to be balanced. Uh, this, the weight of this pile has to be balanced somewhere here. So the stress has to transmit from the top to the bottom. But the way it transmits is highly inhomogeneous and very uh, dependent on the network that forms. So for example, if you were to shake this and then let it settle again, it will not form in the same um, exact point, but it, there will be um, very different uh, in, uh, stress propagation properties depending on the network. But so what can you do? Uh, can, is, there, is, is it still hopeless? Uh, can you actually write down some continuum elasticity treatments? So what we did was uh, looked at the same problem of stress transmission and um, created a packing, a granular packing, uh, and created some uh, sort of deformations or local stresses. So for example, here we took this uh, um, local uh, region of the system and added some forces, so represented with the arrows that are pointing downwards, and we had to uh, balance the forces somewhere, so we created this line and uh, balanced the forces. Well, it's basically like pinching the system, trying to understand what the stress uh, transmission properties of the system are. Uh, so for, as I said, for one, one configuration, it is highly dependent on the internal structure. But then we ask the question, so here we said, what is the stress tensor, the local stress tensor on every grade look like before this pinching has happened? So it looks like this. And after the pinching happens, it looks like this. So extremely, um, uh, sorry, uh, after the pinching happens, it looks, uh, it looks like this. But it um, has been averaged over many, many different configurations. Actually, if you look at the uh, color bars here, this is 10 to the minus 2, this is 10 to the minus 4. So what we do is we look at the change in the stress tensor because of this pinching, and you average over many, many realizations. So in one realization, you actually see nothing. You basically see random noise. But if you average over many, many realizations, slowly you start to see an emergent uh, stress tensor that uh, appears because of uh, configurational average. And what we can do is uh, apply the theory of linear elasticity and ask the following question, what would be the stress tensor that linear elasticity predicts in this geometry? So you can basically solve the cauchy navier equations in this geometry and we get basically the same stress response that you get from a disordered network on average. So the point then becomes that average stress response of a disordered network our average properties of the disordered network really resemble the properties of linear elasticity. Uh, that is a curious uh, phenomenon that we would like to explore further. Yes, please. No. So these are the, uh, we, yeah, so I, I haven't added any, let me go back. I haven't added any friction in this. So yeah, this would uh, be a very different object in if you added friction. But we can't generate these microscopic models 
with fiction. You have to have history dependent interactions, which, uh, yeah, that's a little tougher. So this is, these are local interactions without fiction. So what you could do next is sort of create a field theoretic description of uh, such a system. Uh, and I won't go into much detail on this, but what you can do is uh, imagine that you, are, you have a stress tensor field uh, in, uh, in, in the, in, of, of the system and posit a partition function description. So what you can do is you can say, uh, given some external forces, there, there are all possible fluctuations of the stress tensor, the local stress tensor uh, allowed in the system consistent with the, the condition of mechanical equilibrium. So I'm ca characterizing the full stress tensor landscape, allowing only for mechanical equilibrium configurations. So what that you would uh, impose in some sort of delta function constraint saying that there is a divergence of the stress tensor ha is uh, response to an external force and everything else is just a Gaussian fluctuation of the stress tensor, uh, which is some uh, probability distribution, which is some exponential, uh, which is given by this action. So you can say every component of the stress tensor just has some uh, quadratic uh, Gaussian behavior and the connecting elements uh, is given by some uh, correlation function matrix uh, as usual in uh, Gaussian field theories. And you can basically then just from this very, very simple partition function try to derive what the correlation functions look like. Uh, these equations look complicated only because you have these indices, but actually it's just a Gaussian theory with Gaussian correlations. And if you actually do the calculation and predict what the uh, correlation function looks like, you can actually get uh, the correlation function in Fourier space. And uh, this is um, recently developed uh, understanding of low temperature physics of constrained uh, spin systems uh, show these uh, very interesting properties called pinch point singularities. I'll describe this in great detail. Uh, you can actually compute from this Gaussian theory what the correlations look like. So then the question becomes, can we ma match this? And it indeed uh, we can. So I'll go through this in detail in two dimensions. Uh, this uh, lambda tensor, this is the mixing tensor of the Gaussian action for the stress tensor, uh, actually uh, can be written as some diagonal form in this in this manner. And if you do uh, posit such a diagonal form, you can actually derive the correlation functions. So these are the correlation functions in Fourier space and angular dependence of the correlation function in Fourier space, which, which is basically given by the formula I uh, described in the previous slide. One thing to note is that really it only depends on the angle. And this will come into play later. I will show you uh, more evidence for this uh, from microscopic theories. Uh, it only depends on the angle. So it depends on how you approach uh, Q equal to 0. That is the large length scale limit uh, gives you different uh, correlation functions. So this is this telling me that there's anisotropic correlations at the really large length scales, uh, which I will show evidence for. So um, this was a field theoretic description. So then we uh, decided, why don't we test uh, these correlation functions in microscopic models where we can actually calculate things exactly. And uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes, I will uh, sort of describe, so, oops, sorry, some uh, microscopic models where you can do some exact calculations. And we will then calculate the correlation functions for the stresses, uh, stress distributions in, in such models. And we and surprisingly, we see that it matches very well at large length scales with this field theoretic description. Yes. 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 Absolutely. It only comes because of the tensorial nature of the stress tensor. Sorry? No, it's basically the fact that you have, let me just go back. I mean, yeah, so you're going all the way to the end of the talk, but uh, let me, oops, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it's because you have this sort of co constraint. This constraint really gives you the anisotropic correlations in, in this because of the mixing. So if you uh, impose this along with this mixing tensor, you get anisotropic correlations. You can actually go to uh, coordinate independent uh, representations and you can see that that, that will occur. But uh, yeah, yes, please, yes, please. So there is no Q dependence. So this is because this field theory is purely local. So it's only the, exactly ah. the Q0 limit that you can extract. Exactly. So the, what, you, as you're pointing out, when Q is equal, there's no Q dependence in this in this action. So that's why there's no Q dependence here. But if you were to add some uh, R i R prime R double prime and uh, integrate, you will possibly get some Q dependence at the at the low speed. But that I have not checked. But that's a very good point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a very good point. 
this exact theory has no Q dependence as you because of this. But another point I would like to make is that if you did not impose this and you just had a Gaussian action, you would get the usual 1 by Q squared dependence. That is the liquid like correlations. Because you have the local constraints, you get this Q independence and that is what the pinch point singularity is. Possibly, if you had put in the, the, the correlations here, yeah, yeah, that's possible, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. But in this, it's local, so yeah, you don't have it, yeah, absolutely correct, yeah, thanks, that's a great point. Uh, so, sorry, so let me go back, sorry, this is a bit strange, it's not, yeah, so um, the kind of models that I'm going to describe uh, in the next five minutes is basically spring-like models where you have particles that are, um, interacting through spin uh, potentials or you can have these uh, uh, deformable particles which are slightly deformable and so you have uh, uh, basically harmonic uh, interactions between particles or you could have Leonard Jones particles. So we are uh, Leonard Jones basically with a cutoff so up to some radius you have uh, some interaction between particles. So we are going to look at these two models, I will describe them in more detail in the next few slides. So uh, harmonic interactions are basically particles that have a small intera uh, inter interaction through an overlap. Uh, this is some idealized model of de slightly deformable particles and this is sort of used a lot in the jamming literature uh, or the granular uh, literature to understand uh, the jamming transition. Uh, so where you basically have uh, distance dependent interactions where if Rij which is the distance between particles is greater than Aij which is the uh, summation of the radii of particles, uh, you basically have uh, zero interaction but if uh, if there is a slight overlap, the harmonic interaction turns on. So uh, what you could do is now start with a crystalline configuration and add a little bit of disorder in the radii of particles. So AI is basically the radius of every particle and you can add a little bit of disorder at every site uh, using any protocol you would like but the natural choice would be have a small uniform distribution about zero and uh, tune the amount of disorder by some polydispersity parameter uh, which is what we do. Another uh, model that we study uh, where we can again uh, derive exact results is that um, you ask uh, the, you look at the Leonard Jones uh, interaction with some smoothness which you can basically add other terms so that you have uh, smoothening of the potential at this interaction cutoff and there is again a cut cutoff distance which is basically uh, 2.5 uh, in this case uh, up to this, uh, this interaction radius where you have this. Um, circle plotted and you can again add quenched uh, interactions uh, into uh, th this model uh, by labeling the particles with they are either small or large particles uh, and you can actually add a little bit of quench disorder and create near crystalline configurations. Again, so these are uh, 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 these are pr protocols that are already uh, very well known in the literature so we are just uh, following that. So once you have this you can actually create something known as a disordered crystal. You can tune uh, from a crystalline configuration all the way to an amorphous configuration by introducing uh, this quench disorder. So for in this case, this is a uh, short range harmonic interaction. Uh, we uh, add the polydispersity to the system, uh, to the particle sizes and we uh, tune the disorder all the way from uh, uh, crystalline to the amorphous case and uh, you can actually see that the, there is uh, contact breaking with increasing disorder in this in this model but it still has very high crystalline order up to a large polydispersity and if you look at real space correlation functions it is very very hard to distinguish uh, between uh, this co configuration and this configuration. Here the color represents the number of neighbors of every particle. So uh, there is a nice phase transition that occurs if you look at uh, the polydispersity on the x axis and you look at uh, the over compression, so how, how far uh, you have compressed from a crystalline configuration and at some amount of polydispersity you go to, from a crystalline phase to something known as a disordered crystal phase uh, which I won't discuss in too much detail today but you go all the way to an amorphous solid by increasing uh, polydispersity. So the, the, sorry, so the question becomes, let me just go back one slide, the question becomes can we now because we have this crystalline configuration do some perturbation expansion or to do some treatment uh, around the crystalline state to understand what kind of fluctuations you would have on the stress tensor for these configurations. It turns out you can exactly do that and I will describe some of our exact results here and uh, then try to connect them with this field theoretic description of stress correlations and it turns out surprisingly that at large length scales it matches exactly. So uh, let me just go through that. 
what you can do uh, is basically write down the force law that I was uh, talking about, the harmonic force law, which um, happens to be a linear force law if, if the exponent was 2. So the force between particles exactly is basically this 1 minus Rij by Aij. But the thing to consider here is that this Rij hat, which is the vector pointing along the uh, configuration, so particles i and j, is, uh, leads to some non-linear uh, force law. So it, it looks linear here, but if you were to write it down in the x, y coordinates, which is the only democratic coordinate for all the particles, uh, you would actually end up with uh, Fijx and Fijy having this extremely non-linear uh, looking function. And what you can do is do the same trick that you do in quantum mechanics. Uh, you start with a crystalline state and you create a perturbation expansion about the crystalline state uh, where the, this was the quench uh, variable at every site. For example, this was uh, in, the, in the case of the harmonic interactions, it was the size of every particle. You start with equal size particles, have a t tuning param parameter lambda and just uh, create a um, uh, perturbation expansion about the crystal. So you say as a response to the disorder, the positions of the particles change a little bit. This in turn leads to the changes in the interaction uh, interparticle forces uh, because of the, if, if you just go back, because you have a force law. So if the particle positions change, the forces will uh, change uh, accordingly. But now because of the change in the forces, you uh, have to sort of expand this force law in the, the usual way that you would do, just create uh, some uh, Taylor expansion. Each of these uh, coefficients, because they are drawn from the crystalline state, happen to be um, independent of uh, the actual position. They are just uh, translationally invariant coefficients. And uh, you can sort of just write down the force balance equation at every site. I will not uh, go into all the details. But what you can do is you can actually perform a systematic expansion of the displacement fields, systematic expansion of the forces, match the force law, that is impose force balance at every stage of the perturbation expansion. And sorry. I'm sorry if it went back. Uh, match at every order of the perturbation expansion, and you can actually solve these equations. So you can solve uh, the equations at every step, and you will get at first order uh, in the forces the, in the uh, in the perturbation expansion. You can solve for the force balance again. You can solve for the force balance second order, and so on. At, arbitrary high order. So what have we done? We created a set of equations that will represent the change in the positions from the crystalline state as a response to the microscopic uh, disorder in the, in the configuration, but maintaining force balance at every stage. So once we do that, we can actually solve uh, in terms of Green's functions. This is the last slide with a lot of equations. You basically write down what the change in the positions of the particles are in response to the microscopic disorder, which I can write in terms of some for, so in some source fields, uh, which basically these source fields contain the microscopic uh, information about the quench disorder. And once you have that, you have the exact solution because now you have enough equations to solve. You can actually write down all the displacement fields uh, in terms of the microscopic quench disorder. This is different from the solution of linear elasticity where you solve continuum elastic equations as a response to external forces, this is microscopic disorder inside the, in, in the configuration solving for force balance. So once you do that, once you have the uh, um, displacement fields, you can actually derive the stress uh, tensor exactly and you will be able to write down the stress tensor in terms of some microscopic variable which is the quench disorder. Once you have done this, you can actually calculate the stress correlations because every configuration of microscopic disorder leads to one stress field imposing uh, force balance at every stage and you can now calculate all the um, components of the stress tensor. So just to show you a proof of principle that this can be done, you can actually uh, first calculate a displacement field away from a single defect and uh, it matches exactly with simulation. So you take one defect or you increase the size of one particle and you actually see that the simulation and theory matches exactly. Uh, you can also show that this at large length scales, the predictions of continuum elasticity are um, uh, read, uh, uh, you can are recovered, you can actually get a 1 by R uh, dependence of uh, the displacement field. Again, you can just put this back into the cauchy navier equations that I showed right at the beginning and you see that um, you get the predictions of linear elasticity. Uh, sorry, this. Sorry, this is sort of malfunctioning. Okay, so uh, you can actually also uh, go all the way uh, to looking at nonlinear elasticity corrections. I will sort of skip over that, but you can show that 
linear elasticity predictions will tell you that superposition of solutions are allowed. But if you do the full perturbation expansion at every order, you will see because you have nonlinear corrections, you can actually predict nonlinear corrections to elasticity, which I will not go into at this point. And you can go on and predict uh, uh, correlations between uh, defects, interactions between defects, uh, which exactly match because of this theory at near disorder. Okay, so now the question becomes: If you had a little bit of defects in in the system, what happens to the stress fields? You can calculate uh, the stress field uh, produced by a single defect, and you can show that at large length scales, uh, the so the source terms that I was talking about actually have this one by r squared decay, uh, which uh, leads to uh, anisotropic correlations, and you can actually get the full anisotropy uh, only because of this. Uh, the, the alpha beta components of the stress tensor, you can actually predict what uh, the, the correlations are. This is exa exactly the prediction of continuum elasticity because this is a uh, non disordered medium. But now we can take that um, prediction of the stress tensor because uh, coming due to the uh, disorder uh, and now compute the correlations exactly because if I want to compute the correlations in Fourier space uh, between the components of stress tensor, uh, I had written everything in terms of the source field. So I, all I have to do is calculate the source field terms and because I know the correlations between the microscopic disorder, I get the answer uh, for the stress tensor correlations. And it just looks a little complicated but everything can be written time in, in terms of the geometry, the interactions and the angular dependence of these interactions and we can actually find the exact correlations and uh, I will show you some uh, answers based on this. Okay. So, um, here is what we find, right. So, if I was to look at the correlations in the stress tensor for near crystalline packings, we actually see that if I look at the correlation between the xx components, so sigma xx, sigma xx correlations in Fourier space, this is what I mean by the pinch point singularities. You see in Q, this is Qx and Qy, if you come along this direction, you have some correlations. If you come along this direction, you have zero correlation, come along this direction, you have a positive correlation and all of them meet at this point q equal to 0 which is telling you that the q equal to 0 point is singular and the approach in different directions has different um, limits that is this uh, sign to the 4 theta that I had shown you right at the beginning. So, this is true in uh, both the harmonic uh, intera uh, interactions as well as the Leonard Jones interactions. In both cases you can actually do the same perturbation expansion and get uh, exact results and this is the integrated correlation. So, we are just basically integrating the correlations uh, in theta. So, this is the theta in, in Q space and you can see this is the sign to the 4 theta and it matches exactly. Uh, similarly, you have xx and xy correlations uh, which have the sin square theta cos square theta dependence uh, and this is the xx yy correlations. So, I am uh, not going to go into this, but you we see some small deviations because of the crystalline nature which we are still investigating, but on the whole these look very similar to the correlations you would derive from the field theory. So, then uh, you can match them at all at all q not just at small q, this is just a, a proof of principle that if you looked at the correlation function of the stresses in the entire q x q y range, the theory and the numerics for the near crystalline packings match exactly. So, then the question, oops, I do not know why it is. Uh, So, then the question becomes what happens if I look at fully disordered packings, not just near crystalline, not uh, devi small deviations from the crystal, what we could do. Uh, so, this is work we uh, recently did where we looked at all possible uh, boundary conditions where you take commensurate a box where you can create a triangular lattice, you can look at an incommensurate box where the triangular lattice is not. Uh, it does not yield a crystal. You can take the disorder all the way from very, very small uh, disorder which is this is eta equal to 0 0.05, 0 0 0.05 which is basically a polycrystal and uh, create uh, a disordered uh, configuration all the way to a fully amorphous configuration and measure the stress tensor and the stress correlations in this system. So, that is what we did and um, so, this is what we saw uh, at large length scale. So, uh, we basically uh, looked at all of these configurations at all different eta. This is, so, this is very, very far from a crystalline configuration. It is actually a uh, completely uh, amorphous state and uh, if you look at the um, uh, orientation correlations, you see a completely amorphous state uh, and we looked at all of these correlations and they all fall on top of each other. If you look at the readily averaged uh, correlation function uh, in Fourier space, this is for all of them. Uh, at all eta, they basically fall on top of each other and here is the point that I was sort of burying under the rug. There is a small difference here on in the angles depending on whether you are in the crystal or not, not in the crystal, but that is 
the only small difference that we are so, sort of uh, investigating at this point. But at very large length scales, because this is a small Q behavior integrating around uh, small Q, you get universal correlations. So um, this large length scale behavior actually you can do in multiple ways. You can actually divide by the pressure, squ pressure correlations and it turns out that if you divide by the pressure correlations, all uh, the data collapses onto uh, one master curve, regardless of what uh, parking fraction you started with, uh, regardless of what disorder you started with, because depending on the pressure, uh, there would be, if there, if there was large uh, in initial pressure in the configuration, then there would be large stress fluctuations. So the, the magnitude of the stress fluctuations exactly uh, can be, um, can be normalized by the pressure fluctuations and you see this uh, master curve and here this is sort of the main result of our uh, of our work where we are showing all the components of the stress tensor can be predicted exactly and uh, let me just go here. So you have some small dependence on the pre-stress which can again be uh, incorporated in the pressure fluctuations for both the models. The pressure in the leonard jones model and the harmonic model you actually get, uh, they, they depend on the pressure but if you uh, scale it by the pressure square you get uh, universal correlations. So then the last point I would like to make is that you can look at uh, the transitions that happen. For example, as I mentioned, if you start with a, a crystalline state, you add some disorder, you will actually have a disorder induced transition. So in the short range model, you have a very well defined uh, amorphization transition. In the long range model as well, you have uh, a very well defined amorphization transition, which you can uh, measure through orientational correlations, as well as the fluctuations in the orientation correlations. And across this transition, it would be very interesting to see what really happens. How come the stress tensor uh, correlations are so universal? And so this is my last slide. Uh, we see this very interesting behavior. In the crystal, if you look at, this is just xx correlations, uh, the sigma xx, sigma xx correlations. Uh, if you look at very, uh, this is eta equal to 0.3, so it's not uh, near crystalline. It is uh, quite far away from crystals in the sense that it has large fluctuations in the stress tensor, but because you're below the transition, so let me just go one slide back, the transition happens around 0 0.4, so this is at eta equal to 0 0.3, you actually see a Brillouin zone. Brillouin zone is periodicity in Fourier space. Uh, so you see these correlations that I was showing. These are the pinch point correlations I was talking about at Q equal to zero. But you see a very interesting uh, Brillouin zone appearing here. But as you go past the transition, you see this loss of Brillouin zone. So the sh short range, uh, sorry, the long length scale physics, which is buried in this Q going to zero limit, uh, really remains unchanged, as I was saying. So there is a universality at Q going to zero. But the short length scale physics uh, really seems to show you that a Brillouin zone get, gets lost. And, and this correlation function seems to give you a very direct way to measure the transition between amorphous and crystalline. Uh, this is an intriguing direction we hope to pursue in the future, but uh, with that I'd um, sort of just, sorry, uh, <coughs> flash my conclusion in summary and I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah. So yeah, questions? Yeah. Hey, uh, so in the Leonard Jones potential that you had used, right? Yeah. And you said you used a cutoff uh, for uh, Rij divided by. Two, uh, I think Aij a, divided uh, by two Yeah, uh, right. Less than two so, that, so that's uh, uh, that makes sense if you uh, if the particle that you're considering is very small, right? Mm -hmm. you know, but but if the kind of. Uh, so this is the re representation of how far the interaction goes. Correct. So it goes up to the third shell. Correct. Correct. So, but, but in a classical sense, the Leonard Jones is typically used for uh, molecular systems where the cutoff is much smaller, right? Uh, no, this, this is usually the cutoff. 2.5 is what, for example, the glass models are, uh, are uh, sort of, uh, you, they tune it, but 2.5 is the usual cutoff for glass, glassy systems as well. Okay. So we used exactly what is there in the literature. In fact, even this quench disorder parameter, we did not invent it. It's sort of used very uh, frequently to study this amorphization transition in the Leonard Jones, but it goes all the way till here. Sure. But you're right, like we want, we don't want it to go too long. The mm -hmm. reason is because otherwise you cannot do computational studies. Then you'll have to keep track of all the neighbors. Mm -hmm. So 2.5 is the usual cutoff distance, but sure. yeah, you can tune that a little sure. bit. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Sure. This follow-up of Genga's question, I mean, I still don't understand the directionality that comes in your system. Mm -hmm. Is there an intrinsic uh, anisotropy or your no. defect uh, by definition uh, picks up some direction and that's where you see the anisotropy? No, so uh, the anisotropy comes in from the fact that you are looking at 
an anisotropic correlation. So let me go back. Yeah, so I am looking at xx, xx correlation. So this already breaks the spatial anisotropy. So this, the sine to the 4 theta is coming because I am looking at along a particular direction. But I can do a transformation of coordinates and actually transform this into this. And I would get uh, sine squared, sine to the 4 theta goes to the cos to the 4 theta. So therefore, the, the elasticity that you have in the system is still going to be isotropic. Yes. And if you were to write it in a tensorial notation, then you wouldn't have this confusion. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, this, what I have written down here, is the, the Lamé coefficients for isotropic elasticity. If I was to look at, for example, orthotropic elasticity or, or some locally broken symmetry elasticity, I would get off-diagonal components here. But this is isotropic elasticity. And... Uh, but that's a very good question. So if I added these terms, I would get deviations from this behavior. This is the isotropic case. Yeah, this is a very good question. Yeah, thanks. So I think there was one last question. Yeah, when you were doing all the derivation, you said that you could get nonlinear uh, yeah. contributions. But in the derivation, I got the impression that all, all the assumptions are linear because you expand in small uh, variations and then you use linear elasticity to couple displacement to stress, so I, it, well, I, I don't know in, in which sense you talk about nonlinear. Thanks a lot, that's a great question. I, I went uh, quickly over that, so let me go to two steps back. So my, the linearized assumptions was for the derivation of continuum elasticity. So this is exactly linear. So this is not what I'm using to calculate the nonlinear corrections. So let me go to the perturbation expansion that I was describing. As I said, I can take an expansion to all orders. So I go if I calculate the forces linearized in the displacement fields, this would represent, for example, the Lamé coefficients up to this order because it only depends on xij, the relative displacement between particles. But in the force law, I can go to any order that I like. So this, for example, here would involve xij, xij. This would give me linear uh, correction, nonlinear corrections. So when I do this, and let me just go one, one, one more step back. I didn't show all the details. I can actually calculate this uh, linear coefficient, non-linear coefficient, go to uh, all arbitrary orders. And uh, when I impose force balance, this would give me the linear elasticity. So I say I have some uh, uh, displacement fields which are related to my microscopic disorder and I can solve this. Then when I impose force balance at every order, I can actually hierarchically solve these equations. I didn't show that. The second order equations actually involve, sorry, the second order solutions will involve the first order, uh, the first order fields as a source term. So you can actually do that. And just to, just to prove that point, let me go here. Yeah, so what you can do is using this hierarchical scheme, because I'm now solving at order by order, linear order, second order, third order, what you can show is that if you place one defect at some, let's say the origin, you have the first order solution, second order solution, third order solution, because you have corrections at every order, and you place another defect at some distance delta, uh, you have the same corrections. Now you place both defects together in the system. So you can have, because of both z uh, defects at zero and delta, you get first order, second order, third order. Now linear order solutions would have superposition. That is uh, two, two defects in the system would have a linear superposition of the zero and the, uh, uh, the defect at zero and the defect at delta. This is what continuum elasticity or linear elasticity would predict. But what you can do is calculate just the difference, put two defects together and subtract the individual displacement fields uh, of each of them and then get a prediction from here. So the left hand side, actually this is a experimentally testable prediction. You create two uh, defects in and calculate the displacement field, subtract the individual displacement fields, whatever is remaining would be correction, corrections to linear elasticity. And in fact, the theory that I was describing, the non-linear theory all the way to second order, gives you the exact values. These are tiny because in the log scale, these are actually very small, but you can actually predict it exactly. So that's, we haven't, so when I'm calculating the stress correlations, I'm only doing linear, linearized. But in principle, you can go higher. So let me just go here. When I'm calculating this, this is absolutely, as you pointed out, this is just linearized. But you can in principle go to higher order. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that question. Thanks, Kabir. Let's all thank the speaker once again. So our next talk is by Sonam Zangpo Bhutia, and today he'll be talking about bound layers in thin polymer films.
Hello everyone, uh, firstly, am I audible, sorry, hello, yeah. So hello everyone, uh, firstly I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, opportunity and uh, uh, I'm a research scholar at uh, IIT Madras and uh, today I'm giving my presentation on the title Bound Layers in Thin Polymer Films. So this, uh, uh, this presentation will be a little different from the rest of the talk because it's highly experimental. So let me go very slowly. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm sure like many of us are familiar with polymers, basically polymers are nothing but uh, macromolecules uh, which are composed of repeating subunits called monomers uh, which form a long chain and this is a real linear polymer chain that's recorded in a liquid medium through a atomic force microscopy. So now let me go into the particular aspect of this polymers, this is confinement. Now polymers generally when they are in bulk state, they can undergo multiple conformations because there's no degree of, I mean there is a, all the three degrees of freedom. However, when we confine this polymer chains like along the thickness direction, we try to bring the polymers in its length scale like RG of the polymer, uh, they, they, are co uh, they are commonly known as one dimensional confined polymer films and uh, similarly we can have a two dimensional confinement, confining from two directions and three dimensional confinement like in nanopores. In this talk, I would like to focus in one dimensional confinement. So one dimensional confinement can basically be of two types, uh, they are either of uh, freestanding polymer film in a nanometer thickness to microns or uh, substrate supported polymer thin films. So this is a very uh, simple schematic I've drawn where you have a polymer chains deposited on top of a substrate, hard substrate in general. And these chains and films, this, they are called polymer thin films, they are generally annealed at uh, temperature above their glass transition temperature to promote the absorption of the polymers to the substrate. So why is this important is because, uh, because of this uh, substrate, hard substrate, uh, uh, the polymer chain dynamics, they are highly affected by it. So the polymers, they undergo very slow dynamics. So, sorry, I think there's a problem in this. I think it's not working. It's not working. Okay. So one of the effects that comes very important is the interfacial effects. That's the, as you can already see, there are two interfaces, one with the polymer air interface and another with the substrate interface. However, the substrate interface are much more dominant over the uh, uh, upper interface. So now why is this important is because uh, we know that polymer thin films are widely used from technology to even day-to-day um, -day applications. Uh, so understanding the structural and dynamical properties like I, don't, I need not mention how important understanding glass transition temperature, de-weighting and crystallization and swelling are so important in polymer thin films. So that's where understanding this interfacial effects are very important. Uh, another hand is the technological application because these polymer films they are widely uh, used in like controlling the addition or uh, depositing a very thin films. So based on this uh, importance uh, there is a, God, uh, there is a consequence of uh, such an interfacial effects is if you look at the cross section, uh, uh, there is a certain layer that has been uh, recently found is such a known as an adsorbed layer or a bound layer, which is next to the polymer, uh, next to the substrate, and which is in few uh, nanometers thickness. Now, the condition uh, for this uh, formation of such an uh, adsorbed bound layer is uh, because uh, if the contact, suppose this is a polymer chain, if the contact energy between the monomers, say suppose these green monomers are adsorbed to the substrate at that instant of time, the contact energy is greater than the thermal energy, thermal energy of the system, then this polymer chains or the monomer get adsorbed to the substrate. However, um, for the each monomer, uh, they can reversibly adsorb and dissolve, but the whole uh, polymer chain to dissolve from the substrate, the energy cost is very high. So that's why uh, the, uh, this results in a, a certain layer which is known as typically bound layer on top of the substrate and the chains are so adsorbed to the substrate that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the chains reaching equilibrium takes a very long time and the process is, I mean equilibrium process is inaccessible. So now uh, why do we need, I mean we need to investigate this bound layer. So in this talk I would like to focus on the investigation or probing of this bound layer. So uh, now the, as you already see that uh, this film overall itself is in nanometer films and uh, uh, determining this bound layer uh, is uh, quite challenging. However, there is a very common approach, uh, okay. common approach which is known as Giselin's approach. I'll come back to this again. So the basically what you have, suppose initial studies were done on polystyrene uh, in the presence of a very good solvent which is toluene. So we basically take the polymer film and then you rinse it or emerge in good solvent to uh, determine the layer. 
So this is, this is an <coughs> atomic force microscopy topography image where you can see the adsorbed layer completely different from the rest part of the flip. So this is like a, uh, once you form the adsorbed layer, you scratch it off the liberating part to determine the step height. So this is more like a destructive kind of a, a measurement. However, uh, it, it gives one way the estimation of such an adsorbed layer. Uh, I'll come back to this approach uh, later on. However, uh, now what we, uh, what we propose here is a, a non-destructive and indirect method to probe this uh, bound layer and how, how uh, close we can approximate. Now, uh, for this we propose uh, uh, alternate method through the swelling kinetics of this polymer films and, and from which we can determine the thickness as well as density of this bound layer. Now, um, uh, some of us might be new for swelling of polymer films. So, swelling is basically a copper transport of uh, 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 mass transport as well as segmental motion of polymer films. Uh, what I mean by that is that suppose you have a polymer thin film and it's a hydrophilic polymer film and you bring in presence of water molecules. Now, because of this uh, polymer likes water and then it's a osmotic pressure and then uh, the water molecules diffuses in and it's a one dimensional diffusion because the polymer thin films are so thin that uh, the interfacial diffusions are very low and diffusion are mostly from the top planar surface. And because of this uh, the polymer chain expands and there is a high diffusion from the top surface and this increment in the thickness can be determined by certain techniques. Now uh, initially we think that if this there is a certain bound layer next to the substrate which has to be compact, dense and immo <coughs> immobilized, it should not undergo such uh, kinetic process of such a swelling. So now with this, I would briefly go to the metallurgy because uh, it might be, yes sir, sorry? Which one sir? Yes sir. Yeah, yes sir, I'll come to that sir, I'll just a brief intro, yes sir, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so just a methodology because uh, uh, many of us are, I mean, so theoretical. So uh, spin coating process is basically, okay, the polymer I take here is a hydrophilic polymer which have a hydroxyl group as you can see. So uh, it likes water. So uh, the spin coating process is very simple process for fabrication of uh, polymer thin films which is a very rapid process through centrifugal force. You put a polymer solution and then through centrifugal force you can get a film in nanometers thicknesses. So with, the, with this we prepare a thin film and in this talk due to uh, for the interest of time I will just discuss one of the system uh, where we anneal the polymer film at 120 degrees centigrade for 12 hours. And the characterization technique which we commonly use for polymer thin films or such nano films are spectroscopic ellipsometry which is basically you have a, uh, uh, for the moment you can forget the chamber, just uh, imagine a linearly polarized light, a known polarized light incident on a sample and the change in polarization state is what recorded by this instrument and we can get ellipsometric parameters psi and delta and then fitting it by uh, optimized model. So my model for us uh, well fits is the Cauchy isotropic model which says it's a uh, highly transparent polymer film and we can simply fit this with data to extract the thickness, refractive index and roughness. Now as a complementary technique we have uh, extra reflectivity uh, where we, uh, uh, the way the probing uh, uh, incident rays are the x-rays instead of white light here. So then we can determine the polymer thickness, uh, density and so forth. So coming to the now the experimental part of it, uh, I'll go a little slower maybe uh, initially like uh, uh, we have a chamber uh, since we are trying to study the swelling of this film, so we need a closed uh, chamber. So we take the polymer film, keep it here and then we start the measurement like uh, ellipsometry and reflectivity. Then we take two water cans where we try to fill it water cans and then uh, close it and then let the water saturate. Once it saturates, the polymer thin film expands which I was initially showing there. Polymer thin films expands when generally in the, along the thickness direction because of one dimensional diffusion. Now how do we confirm this? We confirm this by this technique uh, ellipsometry where you can see psi is one of the ellipsometric uh, parameter uh, which is highly associated with the, uh, the, elect, uh, the dielectric property or the refractive index of the polymer film. Now this, this green symbol is for the dry sample where the polymer film is dry. Now this is the spectra which we obtain and as we increase the, uh, as we record as a function of time, the water molecule diffuses in undergoing increment in the polymer thin thickness and since the polymer refractive index is basically higher than the water. So when water diffuses in the overall refractive index goes down of the system which can be uh, identified by the shift in the uh, this psi delta peak towards the psi peak towards longer wavelength. Uh, as a um, complementary we have also the delta and delta parameter which is basically the phase shift of the S and the P polarized component of the electric field uh, which shift towards longer wavelength indicates that the, the film is becoming thicker and thicker and we can fit this to data parameters 
to obtain the polymer film thickness evolution. So this is a uh, conclusive, uh, I mean, uh, plot for this uh, section where you see that uh, initially you find that the, this is the instantaneous film thickness as a function of uh, time. Uh, time is the exposure of the swelling and we perform for like around six, uh, 650 minutes and for a different range of thicknesses here. As you can see here, we have gone from like 31 nanometers to like 263 nanometers. These are dry film thicknesses. Now, uh, interestingly, the, what we see is that when you have a very thin film, uh, it swells, seems to swell very less. However, with increment in thickness, the swelling keeps on ex, uh, increasing. Now, this does not follow the uh, understanding from macros, macroscopic thermodynamics, which says that if the polymer and the substrates, they are same and the interactions are same with the uh, same pro, uh, preparation method, uh, swelling should be same for all these polymer flames and we are much above the RG of the polymer thin flames. So swelling uh, should depend only on the thermodynamic parameters like temperature, pressure and so forth. Now we come up with an idea that uh, could we uh, describe uh, or could we propose a function, uh, a so called effective, single effective function that would incorporate the swelling of all these polymer flames. Provided there is a layer, uh, we name that to be bound layer which does not contribute to the overall swelling of the flame. So then we uh, then we, what we do, uh, we give the simple equation where try to subtract out this D of S bound layer thickness and then what we do is that we basically, uh, <coughs> sorry, I think this is a problem here, okay. So then what we do is that we plot an instantaneous flame thickness as a function of dry initial flame thickness. Interestingly, we see that uh, for the range of different uh, time intervals, we see that uh, it lies in a straight line and we can bring this equation in terms of a straight line and then fit it by using this equation to determine the, uh, from the slope the C of T, the effective swelling function and then from the slope and the intercept the D of S, the bound layer thickness. With this we further perform for longer range as well and then we obtain this final part where we see that uh, C of T is the effective swelling function. That means that no matter what the thickness of the polymer flame you take, all the flames they swell with the same extent uh, with, and with this common function provided there is a layer that D of S which turns out to be around 6.8 or 1.7 that does not contribute to the swelling. Now we can verify this later on by a direct approach which I will come in few slides. Now before this uh, confirm to confirm this with some independent technique we have used the x-ray reflectivity. Okay. So uh, for reflectivity where you have a reflectivity as a function of a scattering wave vector transfer which is a Fourier transform of this angle of uh, grazing incidence. So these oscillation fringes are basically the so called kissing fringes. It is because of this uh, you have a flame and you, you have an interference of x-rays from the top and the bottom interface. And, uh, and these are for different uh, thin flames as you can see they are just shifted for clarity and we from the, uh, the, the, the width of the, uh, the, the oscillation fringes itself we can determine the uh, thickness as well. However, we can further fit it by using the so called Parrot's formalism which is pretty common and we fit it uh, very well by considering a two layer model uh, which is uh, all over it is a four layer model because you have a silicon substrate SiO2 which is two nanometer determined from SE and then and, and the two layers. Now this can be very well fitted by considering uh, this bound layer and a polymer layer. By fitting this we can determine this so called electron density which is nothing but basically how close the electrons are packed together. So we, as you can see this is electron density as a function of this uh, that is the distance from the substrate. So basically going from substrate towards the polymer flame you can see a very high electron density which is the SiSiO2 layer and then sharp fall towards the uh, the upper polymer layer which uh, identified as the bound layer for us and then the upper polymer flame of a different range of thicknesses. So the electron density of this uh, polymer flame, uh, I mean the, uh, the bound layer comes up to be around 0.4969 electron per angstrom cube. And another thing what we can see here is that uh, the bound layer thickness are pretty comparable for no matter what the thicknesses you take, initial thicknesses and excuse me. And then you have a upper uh, polymer layer which you see that uh, Basically, if you have a thinner flame like 31 nanometer, the electron density is relatively lower and you as keep on increasing thickness, the electron density keep on increasing. This we believe that uh, by looking at some literatures initially, they have also reported that if you have a thinner flame, the electron density is very high. However, if you have a thicker flame, the electron density keeps on reducing. That means uh, it is simply known as a confinement effect. If you have a thinner and thinner flame, uh, the polymer chain densifies, so that contributes to the higher electron density. Now the, the bound layer thickness which we compare is uh, pretty close uh, from an indirect approach. Uh, we try to confirm this by which I initially mentioned briefly by this Gisellin's approach, direct approach. So the basic, uh, basically just uh, what it mean is basically you take a polymer flame and then you rinse it uh, with in our case it is a hydrophilic polymer so GI water 
and then uh, submerge in, uh, in the solvent, in this water solvent for a different time intervals so that we let the adsorbed change to uh, remove as, 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 uh, as much as is possible. So when we look at the, and we do the uh, reflectivity and uh, SE measurement on this uh, change, the, this flame is also known as a residual uh, flame. So if we look at the residual flame thickness as a function of the time of this uh, treatment, which is a solvent leaching called, we can see that uh, as I was initially saying that no matter what thickness you take, initial thickness from 31 to, you can see one order difference from 31 nanometers to 358 nanometers. Uh, we believe that uh, there is a certain layer that's dependent only on the polymer and the substrate interaction, independent of the thickness. So here we can clearly uh, see that uh, a range of thicknesses uh, after certain interval of uh, such an etching, the loosely adsorbed chains, whatever is remained on the top, can be washed off by such a treatment and then the remained chain, it remains a pretty long for like 48 hours. Such an, uh, reports has also been found in other studies. So these layers are so called bound or the adsorbed layers near to the substrate. And, uh, and the thickness are pretty comparable from the two techniques. Then what we do is that we did, we took that layer flame, this, uh, this flame and then did an X-ray reflectivity to find the electron density. So we see that as you can see, these are 358, these are initial flame thicknesses and done X-ray and these are the residual flame spectra. We see for all different thicknesses, this uh, thicknesses comes out to be pretty close and the average out to be somewhere close to what we already found. So then if you look at the electron density, which are again close to the, our fits where we consider the whole polymer flame, I mean the bound layer buried inside the polymer flame. Now, uh, finally, few slides uh, where I would like to compare this uh, same study in an unannealed and annealed system because it's very uh, affected by annealing. Uh, uh, so, just to briefly show the collective uh, normalized swelling, uh, you can see that the annealed, unannealed flame swells maximum. And after a 10 minutes of annealing, just 10 minutes of annealing, you can see the swelling reduced. And then for further uh, annealing after one hour, there's no significant change in this uh, swelling spectra. Similarly, when we look at the electron density, uh, we see that the unannealed flame, which is about 59 nanometers, there is an electron bound density, which is relatively much more smaller than the annealed flame. What does it say is that uh, for now, the take home message is that uh, annealing seems kind of a, uh, packs the polymer chain towards the substrate, which leads to increase in the electron density. Now to conclude, uh, uh, for today's talk, I just focused on this part of this uh, uh, study where you have, we found the, electro, uh, the, the thickness of the bound layer to be for an annealed flame of about uh, 12 hours. We found that uh, the thickness is pretty close, closer. And then I'll come to the, uh, our explanation like why, why there's some difference. Now let's focus in the unannealed part. Now you can see here that uh, swelling kinetic shows that the annealed uh, bound layer should be about like 15 plus minus 3 nanometers. However, the Gisellin's approach, uh, which is a direct rinsing of uh, approach, which says it just should to be about 2 to 3 nanometers. Now, some literatures have found that uh, these are so-called flattened layers or something like a dead layer, which is very tightly close uh, near to the substrate. So, what we think is that uh, uh, from the swelling approach, we are actually not just probing this layer. Along with this, we are probing certain loosely adsorbed chains that can easily be washed up by such a harsh or direct Gisellin's approach. Uh, using a strong solvent. So now when we uh, try to fill in the gaps with different annealing temperature, what we see is that if we let's focus on the swelling kinetics first, we see there is a drop in the this uh, flame thickness and then saturates after just one hour of annealing. That means uh, this, uh, this bound layer which I talked about, the loosely adsorbed chains, now they kind of uh, densify and we saw that the increment in the density as well earlier slides. So this le leads to the decrease in the thickness of the polymer film. So the overall bound layer thickness kind of saturates after a certain extent. Now if we look into the, uh, from the Gisellin's approach, what we see is that that is the red, uh, red uh, circles. So we see that uh, initially it's very low as I was saying because now in this unannealed flames, the, 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 the loosely chains can be easily uh, washed off by this uh, water. And then there are but certain sites which are remain on the chains. That's why the electron density is very low. Now what we do is that we try to anneal the flame and we see that the sudden increase in the bound layer thickness and kind of saturates after a certain period of annealing time. So now why is there an increase in this uh, layer thickness uh, with annealing is that uh, some other reports have also found this, but uh, the, uh, the overall understanding is that uh, when you anneal it uh, at a longer period of time, more and more polymer chains, they can get adsorbed to the substrate. 
And since there are limited sites, because they are already an inner layer which uh, has occupied the sites, so the later incoming chains which uh, we are generally dealing with uh, higher molecular weight, so chains are pretty long enough, only the segments of the chain they get absorbed to these remaining sites or available sites. However, the part of the chains they are dangling out, these are known as the tail part of the chains. Now this overall contributes to this, uh, uh, the adsorbed layer because because even after Gisellin's approach, these chains cannot be removed because it has been, uh, the, uh, the temperature is sufficient enough to let this adsorption. With this, I would like to <coughs> conclude my uh, talk and then the summary is that to, by swelling, we can simply kind of uh, estimate this uh, bound layer thickness and density. And then when you, any, uh, when you have an unhandled flame, there seems to be a significant difference between the two approach, probably because swelling is not just uh, of this, uh, 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 not just determine the thickness of the inner flattened layer, however, also from the loosely bound layer. Then when we uh, anneal it, then we, sorry. then we, uh, when we anneal it, uh, this uh, thickness uh, increases, uh, as you can see, uh, increases with uh, thermal annealing, which because uh, more and more chains gets absorbed to the substrate and uh, it leads to the contribution to increase thickness. That, that's, that's all. I would thank you. I mean, <laughs> I would like to acknowledge my actually supervisor, Professor Dilip, and also Professor Sitesh from Japan. We have collaboration. Then IT Madras, of course, and uh, CSI UGC for my funding. And thank you, everyone. I would like, I'm, I'm happy to take questions and suggestions. Thanks, Anam, for a very interesting talk. Time for some questions. Uh, so, a nice yes, talk. Yes, uh, in slide seven, yes, uh, so you had uh, mentioned that uh, you know yes, you're using some uh, f uh, fitting to get yes. your data, right. and uh, there I think uh, you uh, I think you're showing data for different times. I think the swelling. Yes, yeah, sir. No, the, 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 I think the next slide. This one. Yes, sir. No, the next slide. Next slide. Seven. The okay. data that you had, right? Okay. Uh, that was for different, yes. see this after 5 minutes and 180 minutes, right? Right, right. So I think the one of the parameters that you mentioned goes into the obtaining this fit is the refractor index. Yes. The, the refractor index that you take for 5th fifth, fifth minute and 180 minute, is it the same? No, they are different, sir. Actually, it, it, it exponentially decays down. Okay. Uh, generally, because the polymers have a higher refractive index than water, generally. Okay. So, of course, I mean, and then mm -hmm. uh, when swelling starts, the water diffuses in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the overall, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the samples, refractive index goes down because the water diffuses in. So, we see an exponential fall because uh, if you look at the swelling also, we have initially a very sharp uh, diffusion which is generally known as a Ficken diffusion. It diffuses very fast because of the concentration gradient. And the later part is basically the polymer <coughs> relaxation, the, the change kind of uh, relaxes and try to accommodate more and more water. So, we see similar spectra even for refractive index that it falls sharply initially then it slowly decays down. Sorry, I don't have the plot here. No, sure. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, nice talk actually. Yes. Uh, can you, uh, uh, this swelling rate, right, can you control with the, if you change, control the humidity of the chamber? Yeah, yeah, so we can control actually. We, so, uh, how the control? swelling rate will we have actually? Most of the case your swelling rate is linear, right? It yeah, was yeah. increasing. Mm -hmm. So, if with humidity, how it will change? Yeah, uh, actually we, what we are doing is we are studying in a saturated humidity. It's a very okay, closed yes. chamber and a very small mm. and we have a humidity sensor to sense uh, saturated. Okay. Mm. Within few minutes it's saturated. Mm. But uh, uh, th that can be studied. What we have done there is that you uh, you vary the humidity and do a very static measurements. Mm. Like you take a, like a very low 10% mm. humidity, 10 maintain it yeah. and then see it, how mm. does it dissolve and then go to up to even 90, 99% humidity. So that's that's static humidity measurement. So yeah, let's say you will maintain a 10 or 20 percent humidity. So after the after some time, mm. the, there will be no humid or something. So is the swelling will be stopped? Uh, no, that yeah, yeah, that's interesting thing because uh, well, generally in, uh, in China when we do hu the humidity itself is 40, 50 percent. Yes. So so the thickness is somewhere around say suppose this is uh, 189 nanometers, and when we do uh, measurement at a very low humidity, we, yes. we try to we have a chamber we mm. uh, pass through dry nitrogen. We can control mm. the nitrogen flow to control the humidity. Yes. So when we go like 20, 30 percent, 20 percent, 10 percent, mm. we can see there's a decrease in thickness okay. because. Now yes. the, there's yeah, absorbed that water was, that comes out actually. Yeah, that That's okay. oh yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah Thank you. Nice study that. Yes.
Yeah, it's regarding to what you explained at the end, it was not very clear to me why after annealing there was this difference in the, in the thickness with the gizzeline and the uh, yes, uh, swelling. Because I would have thought that, as you said, uh, with gizzeline, and gizzeline can affect at short times, but at the end it's mostly controlled by how chains are absorbed and interfere with the pre absorbed layers. I would have thought the results should have been quite uh, generic. Quite generic, yeah, yeah. So, so what do we think at the moment is that, uh, this is the one I guess. What do you think is that uh, now the difference is that uh, swelling is a very indirect measurement uh, and we believe that the layer we are determining is that this uh, the bound layer shouldn't contribute to the swelling. However, from Giselin's approach, uh, we find that uh, the, the, uh, uh, what do you call, there are certain tail part of the chains. These are the tail part of the chains because it's a higher molecular weight, the chain is longer, part of the chains are absorbed. They are, this, this, this is known as strain and these are called loops and these are part of the chains that are absorbed but part of the chains which are called tails they are dangling out. We believe that these chains they can undergo some mobility that contributes to the swelling. That could uh, contribute to the swelling. So that's why the remaining maybe from the swelling what we are determining may be just the tightly absorbed which doesn't contribute to the swelling completely. However, the, from the gizzeliness approach which is completely removing of the above layer. Uh, the part of the dangling chains will still be there because part of because its segments are still attached to the substrate, which is because of the annealing. So that's why I think we see the increment thickness because now we are um, determining the whole layer thickness. Uh, at the moment, it's just a uh, yeah speculation. So on that same line, did you try to explore different molecular weights of PBA, or do you plan to explore in yeah, future? Yeah, yes. Yeah, actually, uh, what uh, studies have found is that we have not done for different molecular weights, but what studies have found that if you have a higher molecular weight, mm -hmm. uh, the, the the degree of polymer, the I mean degree of polymerization n is more, right? Mm -hmm. So it has been found that the adsorbed layer thickness goes as square root over n. So more the n, the longer number of chains, uh, these adsorbed layer thickness are relatively higher. And also the kinetics also deep matters, like it takes longer time to reach saturation. You need to any, you know, longer period of time. Go studies are there. Actually. Yeah, that will be something That's interesting nice to explore yeah. in future. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, so do we have more questions for the speaker? Oh, okay, then if not, we'll uh, break out for lunch. The lunch is served outside. We also have some very interesting posters by the students. So please uh, stop by the posters also when you have time. And we meet again at 2.30 and start the last session of the Chennai Soft Monday Day series.